Genesis 26, 18 tells us, Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Well, welcome to this very special edition of Revival Radio TV. I'm excited because we're actually coming to you from a studio that we recently put together for this very type of thing. When something breaks, when it has uh, something in the world about revival, we can run in here, turn the cameras on, and come to you straight on the network and tell you what's happening. Well, recently, uh, I saw something on the Internet, and I wanted to. I was shocked when I saw the connection uh, to the Hebrides revival with our very own president, President Donald Trump. So I knew in my mind that there's somebody that knows more about the Hebrides revival than me. And so I'm pleased and excited to have with us today, Miss Billy Brim. Thank you, Billy, for joining us live from up there in a land far away to the north. <laughs> yes, beautiful, yes. beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. Branson, Missouri. Great, from Branson. So listen, Billy, tell me about this connection with Donald Trump and the Hebrides revival. All right, I will begin. I will begin at the beginning. And uh, first you have to know where the Hebrides are. And they are a series of islands 40 miles west of the most northerly part of Scotland. Right. Um, the sailors say that those are some of the hardest waters to negotiate around the Hebrides. It's 60 miles long, this island of Lewis, which joins to the island of Harris. And uh, through the years, it's been windswept. Not very many people live there. But something started a way long time before what's known as the uh, Hebrides Revival with Duncan Campbell. And it is Awakenings. Can I read you the difference between a revival and an awakening? Please do. Please love to hear that. As I, okay. Uh, the Lord caused me in 2008. He told me to study Awakenings. Hmm. And so in my study of them and, a great, and an awakening that happened in Northern Ireland, I found this uh, definition. And to me, it's, it's right, I think. A case could be made for saying that a revival could be described as a visitation of God's spirit on God's people, but an awakening as a time of such intense visitation that both Christian and non-Christian communities are affected. Revivals alter the lives of individuals. Awakenings alter the worldview of a whole people or culture. And what happened on this island in the Hebrides, the Lewis Island, the Harris Island, was an awakening. And it started way before the prayers of those two, two ladies that you're right. talking about. Right. Or that we will discuss later. Uh, it started, a man came from Scotland because these islands are off the northern coast of Scotland. It took seven hours during the time of the Duncan Campbell revival. It took seven hours in a little boat to negotiate the waters between Scotland and the Hebrides. Right. So you can see how, how they were just so isolated. But a Scotsman came there by the name of MacLeod. And he came in uh, the 1800s. And in 1820, he brought to that island and those sparsely uh, group of people, sparsely populated, he brought the word of God. He taught, and there was an awakening. People were born again. They fell under the power. They were prostrate on right. the ground. They had singing and shouting. They're Gaelic, you know, their language is Gaelic. Right. And they had an awakening that affected the Hebrides. Now, these awakenings are a series of awakenings that hap happened in the Hebrides. They started in 1820. There were 9,000 people who came to the meeting that was the first great Pentecostal type outpouring that you might say on that island, and uh, they didn't have very many more people than that. So you're but it saying affected the so, islands. So you're saying through. you're saying 1820 there was a revival right there on the Hebrides. 1820, an awakening. An 1820 awakening. there was an awakening that affected the uh, that affected the entire population. 
Every mm. person on the islands was affected. Mm. These people weave, you know, and they right. that that's their way of making money and fish, and they're very isolated. And so, uh, what would happen through the years? They learned the Psalms. They they had Christian values. They taught in their schools the Bible. This was what you did ever since they had that outpouring. And when it would wane a little bit, they would pray. And then another awakening would come. It would wane a little bit. That's the history of awakenings all throughout history. Uh, When the people wane, you know, they grow a little bit away. Then those older ones who remembered what it was like before, if you want to call it revival or awakening, they started fervently praying. And then it would come again. And so uh, one of the books that I uh, read and I use for my uh, source material is Sounds from Heaven. The Revival on the Isle of Lewis. It was published in 2004, written by Colin and Mary Peckham. And Mary Peckham said that every house on the island would have um, a family altar. Hmm. And her her dad, who was not born again, would lead the family altar every night. Because that's what you did if you were on Lewis Island. You recognized God and the Bible stories. And so... uh, when the revivals happen down through the down through the, uh, the through the ages, and eventually, Duncan Campbell always said, "I didn't bring this. This was here." And so those series of awakenings were there on this people. And my premise is that Mary Campbell, Mary McLeod, excuse me, who was Donald Trump's mother, she left those islands in 1930. She would have been totally brought up in the presence of psalm singing. Bible study in your home, the whole islands all covered with that. And when she left in 1930, and of course, you know, um, uh, there were a depression was not far away and she left that island. She would have been totally immersed in. She would have been affected by it all. And when she left in 1930, this is this is in my book. Uh, I have a new book called First of All in the Awakenings. at President Donald Trump's inauguration, he took the oath of August with office with his hand on two Bibles. One was the Bible on which President Abraham Lincoln took his oath. The other was the Bible his mother, Mary Ann, had given him when he graduated Sunday school. Uh, my daughter, Shelley, heard him say once that his mother always read them the Bible stories. Well, that's what they did on Lewis Island. They were, they were, they were immersed in them. So, but I close out this chapter in my book. What are the odds of a young woman traveling from Lewis Island in 1930 on a hard pitching boat seven hours just to reach the mainland of Scotland before beginning a long transatlantic ocean voyage to America, by the way, having $50 in her pocket. Hmm. What are the odds of this woman having a son who would own a Boeing 757 jet capable of flying 500 miles per hour, who would become the president of the land she was headed toward to find a job as a household worker? In my uh, thinking uh, and in my surmising and in my study of what things were like on Lewis Island, it was a setup by God. Yeah, it was a setup. So what, okay, so let me ask you this, uh, because obviously, I mean, there's pictures all over the internet now that shows uh, President Trump in front of the house there in the Isle of Lewis. Uh, what, Mm -hmm. What should we as believers take from this connection? back to that great awakening what should we what should we do with that uh what what i what i take from it is uh i understand donald trump only went there once and it was a short little visit you know but his mother went there often so what i take from it is the the molding of a person the molding of a person uh mary mcleod his mother she was molded by it was almost um it was almost a, a, a place that God hovered over so that it would not, tourists didn't come there. Nobody came to Lewis Island to Stornoway. Uh, it, was, it was isolated. And right. his mother grew up in this incubator type uh, a setting where everyone honored God. So when she brings up her little boy, she's going to bring him up with that uh, respect of the scriptures. Sure. respect of the word of God with a knowledge of the Bible story. So I don't know how far away he got to it from it, but now he's getting back to it. And you can tell um, that he, that he had, he holds a scriptural truths in honor That's wonderful. and, and yes. value yes. uh, believers. So yeah. I believe that it is God. I believe that our prayers had something to do with it. 
We've been praying for a long time, and I believe we have a window here um, of, of marvelous things happening. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So you touched on something I want you to go back to, because if there's one common thread that we keep coming through as we study these revivals, and, and we keep coming up on new things all the time, but one of the things that we see often, every time, Billy, is the, and it sounds like, well, yeah, obviously, but the, the power of prayer being involved is always the key that gets the ball rolling. Is that what you have discovered as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you remember what John Wesley said? John Wesley said, it seems that God can do nothing except a man on earth ask him. Right. Well, we know why. And that is because of the authority of the believer. Amen. Uh, when God created this earth, and he put Adam here as the God of this world. Adam had a six-day work week, a thousand years being a day, and a day is a thousand years, so like God had a six-day work week, to see what he can do with it. But God did warn Adam. He said, now you, it is written in Genesis, he put him in the garden to, to keep the garden, it says in the King James. Well, that word in the Hebrew is guard. He knew there was something to guard it from. And actually, without going into a long dissertation on the pre-Adamic civilization, right. Adam knew to guard it, and there was something to guard it from. He did not, as you know. And so the authority on the earth was usurped out of his hands. He had the legal right, Adam did, to give it up, but he didn't have the moral right. But he gave it up, and the New Testament calls Satan the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and we see uh, depicted in the earth, we see that uh, there are the heavens above the earth, which Satan is not in hell. In, in Jesus' time, uh, God said, Jesus said that his throne, his seat was over Pergamon. Mm. That throne can move. We won't get into all of that right now, but he is the prince of the power of the air. He is going to go to hell. It is written in Isaiah. We could teach on this about five hours if you have the time. <laughs> but uh, he's not in hell right now. He's called by our Lord and by Paul, the prince of the power of the air. So the powers of the air operate in kind of a double kingdom system over the earth. And until Jesus came and made a show of him openly, triumphing over him in it, uh, then a death reigned. But after that, Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in earth and in heaven. Go ye therefore. So he gave to us, the born again believers, the authority. Right. We see in Ephesians that we are seated at the own, at the right hand of the Father in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we, in order to, you might say, boss around the kingdom of darkness, because the Bible says that we are, uh, we're translated out of the dominion of the kingdom right. of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of the light. And he said to us in Romans 5, 17, those that have see, received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So it takes a person on earth praying. God gave us the authority. Right. He gave it to us. That's it. That's so it, it takes, exactly. It, it That's takes it. a person on the earth asking him or peoples on the earth asking him or prayer groups on the earth asking him. Uh, an amazing, an amazing, uh, as I have studied these uh, awakenings, every single one of them comes. You don't need an awakening unless you're dead or asleep. Right. So when people get dead or asleep, then a group, God puts it on them, or they, and they see it happening, and they begin to pray, and they begin to intercede. And then God, because they're on the earth and they have the authority, but they're also at the right hand of the Father— then God can pour down these great moves of God. And you have the book right there. I see it. Yes. Uh, you have a uh, fire on the altar, those That's who right. carried the flame. Oh, my goodness, precious six alive. When I wrote my book, um, first of all, and the awakenings, of course, I had in mind our own country, the United right. States of America, Donald Trump being our president. And then I went back. America was born out of something that even history and academia calls the Great Awakening. Right. A Harvard professor said that one cannot understand the thinking of the colonials that uh, entered into the Revolutionary War without a study of the Great Awakening. And uh, so I began with that Great Awakening. Uh, I started, of course, before that with the Puritans and how they came. And, 
And then about 100 years after the Puritans came and the Pilgrims came, rather, uh, uh, America, the colonies had fallen right. asleep. And uh, they had, they had uh, the things that had happened. I mean, they were spreading. The roads weren't good. They were going west. They were moving farther and farther apart. They weren't near a church. And most of those colonies were unchurched. Uh, and uh, so when God, when people began to pray, Jonathan Edwards, Sarah Edwards, and others, the tenants, and God could send an awakening. But I found out just recently, Jean, that the big name out of the whole Great Awakening was George Whitfield. Right. George and Whitfield. other big names out of those Great Awakenings were the Wesleys. But before them, the great, great, great prayer meeting that actually affected their lives and uh, actually who led the Wesleys to the Lord Jesus Christ were the Moravians. Right. And so I've been studying about them. They had, Gene, a prayer meeting that lasted 100 years. Yeah, I, I, I read you some of that. I read on that and I was reading in this book about that. And those of you watching, we'll, we'll give you a link there on the website to how you can get a hold of some of these materials. But for every hour, for a hundred, every day for a hundred years? Yes. Well, how wow. it happened was in, in ancient Saxony, old Saxony, and this was about in uh, 1722, uh, 1722, there was this man uh, named uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Yes, it's von Zinzendorf. And, uh, yes, and he was born into one of the Austrian noble families, very powerful family, very rich family. But when he was a little boy, nine years old, he would talk only about Jesus. I think when he was six years old, he said, I firmly resolve to live for him alone who laid down his life for me. When he was nine, he said, to have a living communion with Christ is my heart's desire never to depart from my Savior. His life's motto was, I have passion, Jesus, right. Jesus, Jesus only. Now he's rich, he's it wealthy. So in 1722, I think it is, he found a young woman, a countess, who believed exactly as he did, and they started buying up huge uh, portions of land, right. a big estate. They laid aside their right to rule. And uh, at the same time, in Moravia, Poland, and Bohemia, there were a group of people that were being terribly persecuted, and they were the Moravians. The Moravians, the Bible had been printed for a long time. The Bible, you know, wasn't in the common man's hands, but the Bible had been printed, and, they, and a German uh, translation had been made. And they saw in there uh, grace, salvation by grace, through right. faith. Yeah. And they were terribly, terribly persecuted for it. So a man named Christian David came over to visit the count when the count was buying up all this land. And he said, there's this group of people that are terribly persecuted. Could they come and, and live on your land? And he said, yes. So he, uh, Zinzendorf called Christian David the uh, Moravian Moses. Right. And uh, he took 10 trips, 10 trips over back into Moravia and took the people out and brought them to live there uh, on the estate. And uh, then other people started joining them because there were lots of persecuted people in those days and uh, other groups out of the Lutherans and uh, Anabaptists and other groups, uh, they came there. And so there ended up to be at this time about 600 people. And with those 600 people came dissension. Couldn't get along. Well, they all had different, the Lutherans different, like different it. forms of worship, different belief systems, different yes, doctrine. liturgies, doctrines. Yeah. yeah. So here they came, and they can't get along. And Zinzendorf, he, he's, he's got an anointing of a pastor. And uh, he goes and visits in every one of their homes, and he starts prayer groups. He'd been right. starting prayer groups since he was a student. And he starts prayer groups in the homes, and he encourages them to pray and study the Word together. It took five years. But after five years, they became um, just as one. And then they came into something called they called the Golden Summer. I've forgotten exactly what year that was, but uh, they had the Golden Summer when in May they started meeting in uh, in larger prayer groups. And throughout the summer, they, they, they increased this praying together. And over in August, they decided to have a communion on August the 13th. 
And the power of God was so on them. They'd been praying together there for days. He had a prayer tower, and they'd been praying there for days. And a wind came. They called it a rushing mighty wind. It came and filled the whole place where they were sitting. And they went to the windows and looked outside to see if they could see a storm coming. There was no storm. It was inside that building, and they had a repeat of Acts chapter two. And they were and actually from that time, even twenty miles. They were actually in the tower, yeah. isn't that Go correct? Ahead. They were in their prayer tower. That they were in the tower. They had the wind came yes. right up the tower. Wind came right up the tower, and uh, they had other people who were out on their jobs working, right. you know, and couldn't come that day. They were twenty miles away. They fell under the power because the power hit them all. So then they're given to prayer. What happened to them? A spirit of prayer came upon them. And with that spirit of prayer, and they began praying, and they increased their prayer times. And then uh, one day in prayer, oh, Zinzendorf was given a scripture out of Leviticus, I think it's 613, where it said the fire was never to go off the altar. Right. The fire must burn continually on the altar. Well, that's the altar of incense and our prayers. It's a type. It's a shadow of our prayers. The altar of incense, it went up to God and it brought a beautiful aroma uh, because the other altar, there were two altars. One was where they killed the animals. Well, God didn't like the smell of flesh, but this altar of incense, it overcame that smell of flesh. And it is written in Leviticus 613, the fire shall continually burn on the altar. Well, wow. Zinzendorf knew that that incense altar was a type of prayer. And so he said, we must keep up prayer. That's when they made the 24-hour um, division. And each hour, they would have two women and two men come and do their prayer and pray together. And then another hour, someone else would, would uh, relieve them. So they're praying like this. They've got the prayer going. It's continual. The fire never goes up. It's not too long before the lost, uh, a cry for the lost comes into their hearts. Mm -hmm. And Zinzendorf says, we're going to have to go. And two men said, we'll go. And away they left. Missionary efforts in those days, early 1700s, were not like they are today. The churches, the, the uh, what you might call the Protestant churches, they were arguing right. with each other over doctrine. That's right. They were fighting the uh, uh, the, the, therefore, there was no uh, mission like we know, no missionary effort. And so from that prayer group, the missionary effort began. And they, uh, and they, and they started going. Now, in those days, it was, it was hard, like in Sierra Nome, in uh, Central America. They went all over the world. Right. There were places that were closed. And so they would sell themselves into slavery, lifelong slavery, or whatever they had to do to be missionaries. One writer wrote, uh, he was a, a, a reporter, and he was on a ship with some of these Moravian missionaries. And uh, they were crying. There were five families. They were crying all the time. And then the ship came to an island, and there was a sign on that island. It's in this book. And it said, if you enter here, leper colony, whoever enters here, uh, can never return. And the five fathers got off and stayed on the liberal colony and the family moved away. They did that. They loved not their lives to the death to right. bring missions to the world. So let, let's wrap this up because we you talked about the Moravians and the, I mean, the prayer tower and a hundred years. I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my brain. Can you imagine with all the technology that we have nowadays that for us, we should be able to do that. And yet here they are doing that so many years ago, this 100 years of prayer. The, what we want is we want an awakening because that's, as you, by your definition, the awakening is going to change our culture, correct? Yes. So as right. we go to prayer, it affects, everyone. it affects everyone. So as we're going to prayer about revivals and what we want, what we really want is the culture to be changed, like what happened in Wales and what happened in so many other places. The, it affected not just a little group of people, Yes. Because you can have revival and I can have revival, but no. we want an awakening to affect the whole culture. I mean, we've how many times have we talked about Wales where That's right. where everything stopped, crime went, they they disbanded so much, uh, the bars yes. shut down, the pubs yes. closed because it affected a culture. So what we want is an awakening, amen. Absolutely, amen. Yeah. So let, we're going to continue. Amen. What we're we going want to is continue. An 
and continue and continue to contend in the fire on the altar, like you just said, is that prayer that we need to be offering up. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep you on the you line. What, Go ahead. Yeah. Do you remember what what Titus Cohen said about the Finney revival? No. He what said, he if say? we do what they did, if we do what Finney did, he said, if if I do, and he was going to go to Hawaii, he right. said, if I do what Finney did, I'll get what Finney got. That's and right. Then he went to Hawaii, and Hilo was founded in a great awakening that came. That's how that Praise city came God. to be. He, We have to do what they did. If we do what they did, then we can get what they got. I like that. If we do what they did, we can get what they got. Amen. All right, right. Ms. Billy, would you pray for our people watching that they can be the one to help yes, bring Father. an awakening? Go ahead. Heavenly Father, in the name above all names, we know that it was a spirit of prayer that you poured out. That spirit of prayer upon the Moravians, that spirit of prayer upon Father Nash and all the ones who came there. Oh, Father God, please pour out a spirit of prayer upon us. Please teach us to pray like you did Daniel. He prayed and then you gave him the prayer to pray. Father, give us utterance in prayer that we may know that we may have another great awakening in America, but not only here around the world. We thank you for it, Father. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we lift up President Trump. And Lord, I ask you, call again his Amen. roots. Call again his roots to his memory to bring back. And Father, we cover him with protection and the prayer that he ushers in and he helps bring back the importance of prayer in our nation and opens the door to this next great awakening. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Amen and amen, Brother Gene. Amen. You know, before we get into any more history, I just want to take some time and let you see some of the stuff that's on the set. Of course, this is all vintage stuff from, you know, all, as far back as the 40s. But let me show you over here. Uh, like this is one of the... Uh, this is an old shortwave radio uh, that's on the set. And here, there's something here everywhere. Here's a piece of class from uh, Revival Tabernacle at uh, A.A. A. Allen's Miracle Valley. Here's, uh, this is the, a radio that my grandmother, I used to listen to the radio with my grandmother. You know, and this, this is kind of like our his history area. Here you go. Here's a, here's a lady. Everybody seems to enjoy those shows we did on Catherine Coleman. And of course, Smith Wigglesworth, hat from the uh, Salvation Army. Here's a Voice of Healing mag. Here's one of the original Voice of Healing magazines of uh, Walter Branham. This is like, you just can't find this stuff anywhere. We had some of our people like Joseph Martin, who's helping us give all of this stuff. Even around here, let me show you something else. Come on, let me show you this. Brother Copeland's car. This is the one he went all around the country in. It's just a little bit of behind the scenes, why it's so important to watch every week and stay in tune with Revival Radio TV and see what you can find on the set as we uncover wells of revival and bring you face to face with destiny. 